Hello, this is your Mr. Security 702. And if you're wondering what 4.50 in the morning looks like for me, this is it. So, I have some good news for all of you on YouTube. I got my degree. That's right, I am officially a chemist so when I do all of these spiels I actually know what I'm talking about I am starting a chemistry blog for those of you looking to learn more in detail about chemistry than what I am providing here uh, also, about procedures in chemistry, good ideas, bad ideas in chemistry, the whole wide spectrum thereof. Ooh. Also, I nailed my physics grant. If you want to see a video of it, Reference my last video, or I'm gonna put the link in the Dealing McBob. Yeah, I'll put a link in the Dealing McBob. Yep, yep. Okay, I'm pretty sure you guys are tired of messy hair and darkness and yada yada yada, so. Movie magic. Movie magic. Ooh, I like this one. This is what 1.30 p.m. at the college library looks like. And I kind of like it. You know, I could use it for videos. You know, the, the black, the whiteboard and all. With the, yeah. Ooh, I like it. Let's see what that looks like. Ooh, I could use that for these videos. Nice. Doo -doo -doo. With all of that in mind, today I'm going to talk about this, and this, and this, and this. The periodic table. I also have five separate periodic tables on my computer, and First question in mind, of course, would be, why so many? The answer to that is quite simple, really. Different periodic tables have different sets of information on them. Like, for instance, uh, this one has enthalpy of vaporization and enthalpy of fusion on it. These do not. This one has uh, electronegativities and oxidation states, which the others do not. This one happens to be a nice, nifty pocket periodic table. Yes, I'm that much of a nerd. Deal with it. And this one has natural uh, percentages of natural isotopes on it. All of which is useful to me. So, why does the periodic table exist. What is it for? Other than, you know, to eat our souls. You may have noticed a particular structure to this thing. Two long columns, followed by a bunch of short columns, followed by a few more long columns. Now, with this thing, uh, these short uh, these short columns are pretty much 
very different in predictive power than these long columns. And you may have noticed these uh, two rows of uh, separated out elements. And those have very different predict uh, predictive uh, powers than the rest of the table. Now, one constant source of predictive power is the further this way you go in the table, the further this way, the higher the mass of the element. The further down you go, the higher the mass. Another source of predictive power comes from the longer columns. Particul uh, particularly these, uh, these two columns over here, and these one, two, three, four, five, six columns. And this predictive occurrence is in oxidation state. This column right here, the first one, has a plus one oxidation state, plus two, plus three, plus or minus four. Minus three, minus two, minus one, and zero. Now what that means is, well, first of all, since this last row has an oxidation state of zero, it doesn't react. Well, with one exceedingly epically rare exception of xenon here, but yeah, you would have to get that to like, uh, minus 250 degrees Celsius or below and high pressure to get it to react. So, extreme case. But with everything else, the oxidation states predicted uh, give a prediction on how it's going to react. For example, uh, Hydrogen over here is plus one. Uh, chlorine over here is minus one. We can predict what will happen if we combine them. Uh, hydrogen is plus one. Chlorine is minus one. Since opposite charges attract each other, we can see pretty readily because of these opposite charges right here uh, they're gonna attract one another opposite charges attract and what we do when we predict what will be formed is take this number right here for the uh, hydrogen we ignore the sign and we put it over here as a subscript. We take the chlorine here, the oxidation state there, ignore the sign and bring it over here to the subscript here. And we yield H1Cl1 or simply HCl. For another example, one that we deal with just about every day, comes from the, the same plus one, hydrogen plus one, and oxygen, which happens to be in the minus one, or minus two. Uh, since Opposites do attract. Ah, switch up markers. These two do attract each other. Take this, bring it over here. Take this, bring it over here to get H2O, which is something we deal with every day. Or at least hopefully, hopefully every day you take a shower with water. Hopefully every day you drink water. Hopefully 
every day. You brush your teeth, rinsing the toothbrush out under running water. So yeah, predictive power of oxidation states on the table leading to predictive power of chemical reactions. There are other predictive properties to this thing. For instance, further down you go, the higher volume an atom takes up. The further over, the higher volume. The further up you go, the higher the electronegativity. The further over, the higher electronegativity. Um, let's see. The further down, the higher chance it has to be radioactive. The further over, the higher chance it has of having higher radioactivity. So these are just a few of a vast many uh, predictive powers that this thing has. And over the course of the next few months, I'm going to go over a lot of them. Probably not all of them. Well, most likely not all of them, because there are a lot. Yeah. But I will go over some. I can hear the cat calls of, so what? You can predict stuff, so what? Right about now. Well, here's the thing. In order to invent stuff, you have to make predictions on whether or not it's going to serve the purpose you have in mind. For instance, this water bottle. You're going to have to make predictions on what materials will best serve the function of holding water to drink. Uh, huge wooden bucket's not going to work because, well, it's kind of awkward to actually drink from. Um, as far as the materials are concerned, you're not going to make this out of sponge because, well, sponges absorb water and it's going to drip and you wouldn't drink from a sponge anyway because that's just gross. You're not going to make this out of table salt because, well, what happens to salt when you add water to it? It dissolves. So... Try to use this once for water, you don't no longer have a bottle. Uh, you're not going to use plutonium or uranium for this because, quite frankly, the person will die. So, you're going to have to find one, a substance that won't soak up water, two, a substance that well, isn't gross to drink from. Three, you're going to have to find a shape to not be epically awkward. Four, you're not going to have to find a substance that won't dissolve. Five, you're going to have to find a substance that won't kill people, like plutonium or uranium. And in order to make these predictive power... Uh, Predictions, you're going to have to use science. That's the pleasure of science. Science allows you to make predictions. Predictions allow you to make inventions. There you go. Well, there's my spiel on the periodic table. And my first spiel since becoming a chemist. Uh, I hope you have found this helpful and useful and will use it in the future. So, until next time, DFTBA. This is your Mr. Security, 702, signing out.